And it's one o'clock. Welcome to the Deal Doctor live stream. Last week, Jessica Mann, I think it was, uh, suggested that we do a sample pur uh, purchase agreement. And so I made one up, and hopefully you have it there in front of you. You can either pull it up on your computer or you can print it out. Uh, ho hopefully you've done that already. We're going to just walk through it. And bear in mind, this is the West Michigan Purchase Agreement. Uh, we are going to try to get something from GCAR loaded up uh, so you can take a look at theirs as well. Uh, if any of the other multiple listing systems that we use are, and are a part of uh, have different forms that you'd like us to address uh, to give you language that you can put in there, you know, by all means, uh, provide them to me and we'll. Um, you know, do whatever you do, help you any way we can. But for the purposes of uh, a large part of our um, agent population, they use the West Michigan Purchase Agreement. So I thought I'd take a moment, um, actually several moments, it might take a while, and fill in a sample purchase agreement with some language. Now bear in mind when I did this, I am not suggesting that you have to put all of this language in there. Um, there's a lot of language in here, a lot of clauses that I wouldn't necessarily need to put in uh, if, if it weren't for the fact that we were doing some kind of a, a sample here, an example of, of what can happen out there. So let's get started. First of all, whenever you're going to create a clause for, for a client, whether it's a seller's uh, client, a, a seller client, or a buyer client, Keep in mind who you're working for. That's the place to start. If you're working for a seller, you may start out the language, the clause with seller agrees to do something. Um, if you're working for a buyer, buyer requests seller does something. Uh, buyer requests seller to uh, uh, give $3,000 or 3% of the sales price in buyer's closing cost concessions, for example. So when you're starting out to create language for a, a, a contingency of some sort, it's, it's always a good idea to say, first of all, who are you, who am I working for? And then start your sentence with that. It makes it a lot easier. Um, who are you working for? What are you asking for? or giving, and um, what, what, is there a deadline for that? And what happens, what are, this, what are the consequences in the event the other party doesn't agree to those things? All of those things are really important. As we've talked about before, you can put through, you can put the words, uh, this offer subject to a walkthrough prior to closing. Okay, go ahead, walk. Do, do whatever you like, have fun. Uh, it doesn't indicate though that the buyer has the right to terminate the contract if when they walk in there, they find a complete mess, that the seller has left the property um, in, in, in bad condition. If you want that to be the contingency, if that's the expectation that the buyer is asking of you to put into the purchase agreement, then you have to have the words that match what they're asking for. So let's go through a few things here. Um, one thing you'll notice is that when I filled this out, I made sure that there weren't any blanks in it. Blanks is the number one reason that, that uh, real estate transactions wind up in court. So there are no blanks. Um, I indicate at the very top, as you'll see in the, uh, at the very top you have to indicate who the, who the uh, uh, listing office is, who the selling office is, dates, times, and the effective date I want to point out is very important because the effective date establishes when inspection, when the inspection window starts, uh, uh, the clock starts ticking. The effective date is that date at which you have the buyers and sellers signatures in agreement. In other words, the buyer and the seller has reached a meeting of the minds. It does not 
include the acknowledgement of the other party's signature. It only has to do with when they have come to a meeting of the minds. So if they come to a meeting of the minds today, uh, the effective date is today. And as you read that paragraph, you will see that tomorrow is the first full day of the 10 day inspection window. So again, paragraph one is very important to read so that you understand the time frames that you're working with when you are writing a contract. Um, I've indicated here that I'm a buyer's agent. Um, that I put the, the uh, uh, selling agent name is Clark Kent. Um, the email is superman at krypton.com. Um, the buyer in this case has received, we're going to say that they have received the seller's disclosure form. Bear in mind that the, the seller's disclosure form is not required to be signed by the buyer. In fact, uh, in, order to main, in, to, in order to have a valid contract, that's a misconception out there, that you have to have a signed seller's disclosure form in order for it to be a binding contract. That's not true at all. In fact, again, if you read the paragraph, what it says is that the buyer has the option of, of bailing out of the transaction within 72 hours or 102 hours based 120 hours, excuse me, based on when they receive the seller's disclosure form. So be very careful uh, in, in communicating. It's not <clears throat> that the buyer has to sign that seller's disclosure form, but they do have to act on it if they want to use that as their reason for bailing out of a transaction. It's a very important distinction. Um, we include in here a uh, property description for city of um, Metropolis and the address is 123 Lowest Lane, uh, lot 16 Metropolis Meadows, subdivision number one. Um, I made these up. I don't know if you can tell that or not. Uh, anyway, um, parcel number. Under the following paragraph, it says premises to include unplanted land. And I always put any or all if it is not a platted subdivision lot. If it's in a subdivision lot, there's not going to be splits available. Um, and I always include a time frame in which they have to get that approval. Now, if you're dealing with a township, it may take two to three or four weeks to get them to approve a split if that's what you're intending to do. So give yourself plenty of time if that's the case, and don't give you you know don't give yourself a week because it's not going to happen that fast. So give yourself plenty of time there. Um, you have to write in the the uh, purchase amount in in uh, numbers as well as in uh, write it out in longhand. Um, in addition, in this particular case, just for fun. I said the seller to pay 3% of the sales price toward the buyer's closing costs, prepaids and or fees. All of this language you will find in dot loop um, and you can refer to it and pull it out and, and plop it into your, uh, into your purchase agreement. I'm not getting a, a question here. Where are we? I do. Hang on. Scroll back to the top. Oh. Got it. Uh-huh. Okay. Mary asked a question, why are the times required at the top of page one? I was always taught that the time of the contract is not matter and not required, um, as all offers are to be presented at the same time in the case of two offer two or more offers um mary i still do it because um the offers do not have to be written at the same or presented at the same time necessarily and you're right they don't have to be presented according to the the times that they are written um, i do it because 
it's a blank. And I fill in blanks. It's as simple as that. Um, Paul, why do we have a final signature on page six if it's not required? Because it's what we've always done. Um, the language of the Red Book, the law, says that we have to get that acknowledgement signature. However, the courts have held, court precedent supersedes what the Red Book says. And so um, as a result of that, uh, they haven't changed the Red Book. It's still a law, but the courts have held that it is a binding contract at the moment that we receive a, a meeting of the minds where the buyer and seller agree. Uh, I have nothing against having that additional acknowledgement uh, box signed. I, in fact, I think it's, it's not a bad plan. But we don't have to in order to make it an enforceable contract. But that's why it's still there, because some agents think that it's still required by law to get that, and it's not. The, the law has changed based on court precedent. So hope that answers that question. Um, moving on. Um, seller's concessions. Paragraph 8. I put a bunch of stuff in there about it being conventional financing, 30-year mortgage in the amount of 80%, that's 20% down, at a maximum of 5% per uh, year, and the buyer will agree to pay an amount not to exceed, let's say, $500. I get this question a lot. What do we, what do we put in there and why? This number here about mortgage-related repairs is really important. And usually I go as high as $1,000. Sometimes I go $500 for both buyer and seller. And the reason is this. You don't want a deal to fall apart for the sake of $1,000 or $500. It's, that's kind of silly. If you, don't, if you put zero in there, then if there's any repairs whatsoever, even if it's the uh, escape valve on the hot water heater, or a handrail, your deal can fall apart because two people can be fighting over something that costs 10 or $15 to fix, and that's, that's a little silly. So put something in there so that the deal stays together in the event it, um, an appraisal comes back and requires a relatively minor repair. Question. Um, says that all closing costs to be paid by seller if it's a VA loan. What if the seller, what if the offer asks for a specific amount toward closing costs? Doesn't that cancel out all closing costs in the PA? Well, what I would encourage you, Joanna, to do is to talk with the VA lender about the specifics um, of what the closing costs are that would not be covered. Um, Because I think there's confusion in, in uh, there may be some confusion here in your question. Uh, the closing costs that are paid by the seller, for example, are um, termite inspection. The, the wood destroying insects uh, inspection is required to be paid by the seller in a VA loan, but it's not required to be paid by the seller in a conventional or FHA loan. Um, all closing costs, uh, they're not going to be required to pay all of the buyer's closing costs to set up prepaids and so on and appraisals and all of that. So be very specific with your lenders who are, if you're doing a VA loan, that you get a good faith uh, estimate. Um, I can't remember the name of it now, but it uh, basically is their cash to close estimate for your VA buyers so that you know exactly what's going to be covered. But as I said, in the case of, for example, a termite inspection, the seller would pay that, whereas in a normal transaction, the buyer might pay that. I hope that helps. Um, number nine. This is one we get a lot of questions on. Um, in this particular case, I use the example of it is contingent upon a closing of a particular property, uh, the owner's property, which is located at Unit 802, the Daily Planet building, condominiums, and so on. Uh, and that is to close on or before 331. 
Well, hmm, does that give the seller the opportunity to get out of the contract if that buyer doesn't have an underlying sale on their condominium unit in the Daily Planet building by the end of March? And the answer is no, it doesn't. That actually isn't out for the buyer only. Uh, we've been down this road quite a few times where a seller says, well, they didn't, they didn't sell their house according to the contract that they offered, therefore we want to kill the deal. But that's not actually um, possible uh, until the actual end date of the contract. So be aware that when you're writing that, uh, you want to make sure that the sellers understand that this is an out for the buyer, not for the seller, if they don't reach an agreement, uh, an underlying contract that is not contingent, by the way. If they reach a contingent offer, if their house is contingent, the underlying sale is contingent on a yet another sale below that, then the house is still not technically removed from the market. So again, you have to look at all of the uh, purchase agreements that might be in the chain. Same thing with um, the line here about a contingent upon sale and closing. If you're out there and you're in a foot race with other buyers waiting for your listing to sell in order to make the house that your buyers want to go pending, um, you have to make sure that whatever offers you are getting and that you're submitting to the listing agent are in fact not contingent. That they don't have a string of dominoes below them of houses that have to sell and close in order for that top house to sell. If they have all sold, if they all have purchase agreements on them, then, then yes, the answer would be then that house would go pending. But if there's some in there that haven't sold, then that house at the very top would not necessarily go pending. It's confusing, I know, but that's a call I get a lot um, about. Um, the other thing under, un, under exceptions, I also added a, a line here, subject to parcel to be listed as pending immediately upon receipt of a non-contingent underlying sale on the buyer's home. It makes it very, very clear that the moment that I provide the listing agent a non-contingent offer, that house, that top house on Lois Lane in this case, has to go pending. It says it right in the purchase agreement. Um, under fixtures and improvements, I encourage everyone to read that. Actually read what that says because it will show you what uh, the MLS considers uh, fixtures versus uh, real uh, personal property. Um, for example, if it is not nailed down, screwed in, glued on, um, then it's probably personal property. For example, a range oven unit that slides in is personal property, it's not real estate. Um, same thing with a microwave uh, and the 1950s era telephone booth um, should remain with home. It's very important in this case. Anyway, any questions on that one? How are we doing? We, any more questions, Dom? No. Okay, moving on. Question 12. Um, Seller shall pay the entire balance of any assessments that are due and payable and a lien uh, and payable on or before the day of closing, regardless of any installment arrangements except for any fees that are required to connect to public utilities. Wow, that's, a, that's an interesting one. We, again, we get this question a lot because there may be an assessment in the road which will require that when a well fails or a septic system fails, you will have to connect to the septic, uh, uh, the sewer line or the public uh, water line that you cannot build a new well or, or uh, a septic system. Um, many of those homes have a 
an assessment against them already. Um, and the question becomes, um, how is that defined? Uh, if it says the seller shall pay the entire balance, well, they may be paying, you know, uh, several hundred dollars a year toward that outstanding assessment for the sewer line that's been put in or the water line that's put in out in the street, but they haven't hooked up yet. And so each year they pay uh, an installment amount and sometimes they perceive that the new buyer is going to take over that installment amount and pay it just like they did. But that's not what the purchase agreement says. The purchase agreement says that they're going to pay for it except for any fees required to connect. Well, the way that I read that is we're talking about the lineage from the road to the house to connect either the well or the septic system uh, that would be done by a plumber or a, uh, a, a septic system installer um, or by a sewer system installer. That's not the same as the road frontage. So if you get into a situation where there is uh, an assessment for uh, you know water in the street or sewer in the street, um, make it very, very clear who is going to pay the balance of that as of closing. If your buyer is willing to take over those payments and continue payment, then you really should check box number two. Um, and probably spell it out in other conditions, just so, or attach an addendum. Um, ran into this one very recently, calendar year proration versus tax proration, uh, uh, property tax uh, uh, fiscal year proration. Um, we used to do it all by fiscal year proration, which is extremely, extremely difficult to explain. Um, it depends on whether that's uh, the taxes are perceived to be paid in advance as they are in the Grand Rapids area or they're being paid in arrears as it is in most other areas of Michigan. It gets to be a, a big um, wad of confusion because each party thinks that they're going to get a credit on the HUD statement for the tax prorations when in fact it's the opposite of what they're thinking. That's the reason we went to calendar year proration some 15 years ago or so. Uh, calendar year proration is very clear. It says that anything that comes due in that calendar year is due and payable on the moment that it becomes due, July 1st and December 1st, for example. That that's the moment that it becomes a lien on the property. It doesn't matter that you can pay, you, you don't have to pay until January 15th or, or September 14th or whatever it is. It becomes due and payable the moment that it becomes a lien on the property and therefore we are going to amortize the total property tax bill uh, for that period of time in 2019 that the seller has lived in the property versus that period of time that the buyer has lived in the property. It's very simple math but sometimes uh, sellers who haven't sold in a long time are not um, particularly aware. Uh, in fact, they, they really don't, they, they think they've already paid their taxes in advance and that has no bearing on the contract whatsoever. Uh, I'm gonna stop just for a second, see. <laughs> Joanna says, I have a three-way contingency deal going on right now. House my buyers are buying is contingent on the seller of that house <coughs> getting an accepted offer on the house the seller wants. Our offer is contingent on the sale of my buyer. All are, all are pending now and went quite smoothly, staying in communication. So, um, I'm going to have to sort through that one a bit, uh, Joanna, because it says that the house that your buyers are buying is contingent upon the seller of that house getting an accepted offer on the house that the seller wants. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to give you a call or, or, or straighten that out because that, that, uh, it, 
would it would seem that the house that the buyer that your buyers want they are the ones who are bringing the offer to that seller um, and that your offer is contingent upon the sale of your buyer's home the question is do you have a purchase agreement that is not contingent upon that um, well I, I I can't answer that right now with the information that I have so if you can provide more that would be great um, moving on well and septic inspection yay um, it says within 10 days after the effective date again that's the reason why the effective date is so important and I want to point out here that if you have written a purchase agreement which is subject to the sale and close 